So what makes a ministry innovative? Today, we are joined by a panel of past grant recipients who, with the support of the United Church of Canada Foundation, have impacted their communities through innovative and creative approaches. We are excited for our panelists to share their experiences and insights with us today. The webinar will begin as a panel interview, and then we'll open the floor to questions. I welcome all of you to type your questions into the chat as we go along, and then we'll address them at the end during the Q&A portion. So without further ado, I would like to introduce myself and our panelists. I am Eric Lofort, the foundation lead, and we'll be moderating the discussion today. Our three panelists are Gloria, Tina, and Anne. Gloria had a 30-year career with the federal service, civil service before retiring in 2010. She is now actively involved with the United Church, holding various roles such as a lay representative and incoming chair of the leadership team at St. Paul's United Church in Aurelia, Ontario. Gloria recently completed a certificate in social justice, leading her work on their eco commoning initiative. Welcome, Gloria. And can you tell us a little bit about your project? Yes, well, our project was uh, when our title on our proposal was eco commoning a 21st century renewal of the United Church's social gospel. And so what we've been working on over the past uh, couple of years is, uh, first of all, gathering together two groups of ministers, one here in Ontario, where I am, and one out in BC. And we were worked on thinking through what we mean by eco-commons and eco-commoning, what that might look like uh, within the United Church, and, uh, you know, how the United Church could be using it to help within our culture during this very transformative time that we're in. So that's kind of a, a nutshell of the project right now. Perfect. Thank you, Gloria. Our next panelist is Tina. And Tina immigrated from the Philippines as a teenager and has been a, an active community organizer ever since. She joined Davenport, Davenport Perth Community Ministry in Toronto, Ontario in June 2014 and practices intentional loitering and discerns. Uh, Tina, can you please introduce your project and talk a little bit about it? Thank you, uh, Eric. I, I think it's because from my uh, my practice of intentional loitering, <laughs> I got to know a little bit more about uh, the stories that people are talking about um, or do not want to talk about. <laughs> so we did that. And um, basically, um, we started first by saying, okay, you know, there are similarities in the food that we eat, um, especially when we go to, to the store they, they in here locally, they find that they have cassava and people say, you eat cassava? And um, so we started out saying, okay, let's, let's do a, um, a gathering of cucums and nonas and grandmothers and lolas and um, have cooking sessions with young people while they're telling the story about how they made it to this place. And at that point, we called it Tasting Davenport Roots. And um, that's how we, we started. Eventually, um, when we started talking about that and finding out each other's stories, um, people wanted to know more about the, uh, the first, um, the original people. So we did Kairos Blanket Exercise. And then the next time they said, can we have that in Spanish as well? So we had it both in, in, in English and in Spanish. Okay. And then as we were talking, people recognized that yeah. there are that kind of, of, um, of um, eviction or that kind of, of um, what you call uh, dislocation that happened. The first is the dislocation of indigenous peoples. And when we, we did it in Spanish, the Spanish speaking people started saying, well, we have been dislocated from where we live because of Canadian mining practices. And then we spoke with some of the Afro-Caribbean members of our community and they said, well, we have been dislocated and our ancestors have been dislocated because of the forcible enslavement. And then 
And then people started talking about how fast Davenport is developing. And they said, well, actually, I'm going to be dislocated by renoviction. So we talked about those four dis dislocations. And as we began to talk about those dislocations, um, we started thinking about the monarch butterfly as our metaphor, the monarch butterfly that flies around and all this kind of thing. Eventually it became a real project. We, we renamed our project Tracing Gete Onigamin Roots, which is the original name with Davenport. And I can talk and talk, so I'm gonna just leave it there. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> No, I actually have just a follow-up for the this. We have people joining from all across Canada, Tina. So for people that aren't familiar with Toronto, can you just describe a little bit of what your community looks like and how it's comprised? It's it's a very interesting community because it was left over from um at the time when industries started leaving for uh, places where they can um have cheaper labor and cheaper places to work. So we've got a lot of industries that have left this place. Um, and so in a lot of ways, it is one of the more affordable places to still go to Tor in Toronto. Um, so there are a number of people who live here, mostly Italian, Portuguese, uh, Spanish speaking, but we also have a Toronto community housing high rises. Um, with a lot more vulnerable people um, that that live here. Um, I think at one point people were telling me that at least 40% of the people who live here are earning less than or about $15,000 a year. And that is from OW, ODSP or underemployment. Um, so it's a very mixed, mixed community because at the same time, as it grows and becomes more attractive and development is happening, more people are moving in, some of them driving huge Maseratis and, you know, very nice. Uh, so it's a very mixed kind of situation that we're having and we're seeing. But at the same time, because we're we're nicely placed, uh, Davenport Community Ministry is, is sort of like how uh, the church um, decided to combine um, its building with another building and formed a center. So. So it became the only neighborhood center in the area, and it's become a community health center later on. So I'm sharing my office with Davenport Perth United Church and Davenport Perth Neighborhood and Community Health Center. And so it is it is sort of like a way where people are gathered together. And so you've got people giving having their COVID injections and everything else side by side with people who are, are basically living rough. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very interesting situation. Also, people who bring their children um, for the drop-in for the Ontario Early Years uh, program also are side-by-side -side with children who didn't have anything to eat that morning kind of thing. Perfect. Thank you, Tina. And our last panelist for today is Anne. Anne is currently the Executive Director at Hillhurst United Church in Calgary, Alberta, and has been serving at Hillhurst for the past six years. Passionate about data, stewardship, and congregational engagement, and played an integral part of, in having 100 people join Hillhurst as members during the two years of COVID. She and her wife are new empty nesters who have turned their efforts to the Ukrainian evacuee hosting initiative, and they are currently hosting a family of six, which includes an eight-month-old baby. <laughs> Welcome, Anne. Can you please tell us a little bit about your project? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Um... So our project uh, is called ex uh, Expanding Music Beyond Sunday. Um, essentially, it's leaning into the other 167 hours of uh, what what music is uh, and what church is in their togetherness and um, how it's expressed, interpreted, interacted with, and in community. And one of the things that we were trying to really think about is that, uh, what community was and beyond our walls. And that's where you actually move from congregation, the use of the word congregation so much to community. Um, my role in the project was to inspire our, our current leaders and find other leaders to dream about uh, what music could be uh, expand their small ministries and how we could create new forms of music production um, outside of the Sunday morning project, I mean, uh, Sunday morning services. Um, what we learned 
uh, right away is that co uh, music took the biggest hit as far as uh, need for uh, adaptation on Sunday mornings. It was a it was just a it was a massive uh, issue because um, we had done music sort of one way for a really long time. And then all of a sudden it needed to be digital. It needed to be with only a few people. It needed to be uh, remote. It was all sorts of things that just not much, much bigger than us uh, that we had ever dealt with. And in that was um, sort of a, a really a really neat thing that happened was that um, as we grew our, our wondering around what music could be, we obviously learned around other, other people who, had uh, just other ideas around uh, how we could produce it. And some of these are people who are not uh, historically church people. And so what they brought to the table was really great ideas of saying, oh, uh, you've got these great musicians here and there. Uh, I'd really like to uh, be part of this in some way. Um, so we, we took that piece of crisis and really tried to look at a silver lining in it and, and kept on asking ourselves again and again is like, the music, because people can't experience music um, in live concert spaces or be in choirs and things like that, is that how do we step in as a church to be able to provide music in an interactive way um, that helps us through this time? So, so the short term answer with our project was, is that we created a, something called uh, Live from the Loft. And um, live from the loft basically was we brought in a music artist in residence who um, had some of a church background and uh, would go into our sanctuary in our choir loft, which was familiar to everybody, which they loved seeing him in the music loft, in the sanctuary, and actually performed music on Facebook and had, you know, two monitors there and it was Facebook live and people were able to ask for hymns, they asked for Billy Joel songs, they asked for this and that, and he would uh, you know, stop every once in a while and and read the comments and communicate. And it was interesting how people started, this community started building. It was beautiful. And people, you know, would invite their mother from Toronto or their, you know, sister from Vancouver. And this reunion was happening in the chat room. It was really beautiful how this all came together. So um, that piece was, the 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 goal was authentic uh, community, and this is what was happening, and we had to think about what it, what it was beyond our walls, and all of this happening beyond um, beyond Sundays. So uh, one of the things that allowed us also to, to do was to step into Black History Month a little bit more authentically and organically. One of the things we struggled with was that um, during Black History Month, um, it just, it felt inauthentic to us to uh, all of a sudden, this is our content right here. And we we were determined to move Black History Month into 12 months, not one month. But during this month, we said we are going to step into it with music very intentionally. So our music artists and residents actually did some research and actually played Black music, did history around the Black musicians, some spiritual gospel music. Um, there were questions that were asked. Um, it was a real learning experience of everyone and it it then that actually spilled over to some um some original music being uh created so it was it it was sort of a balance of, of something that we've been trying to do and it allowed us to do um all at once um and shortly the the other two things that have happened is that we've developed a new pro program called chapel arts which is uh it's a taze uh where they come together it's a contemplative arts worship programming um on sunday nights where congregate gets together and they write and they paint and they draw while live music is happening and in the music in in the uh room also um and it's it's i actually went a couple of weeks so it's, it's really incredible um and that means that we're saying uh sunday is not your only spiritual experience and if you don't go to church on Sunday, it doesn't mean you don't go to church. So church can be all these other programs. And that's what we've decided is that our 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 entire motto right now is the church without walls. And so we ask ourselves all the time, how does that fulfill church without walls? How does that meet the needs of those who are not here physically? And as our uh, congregation um, uh, attendance has decreased, Interestingly enough, those people who usually went to Mexico, like all of the snowbirds right now, they're all in Mexico, all of the ones who skipped the congregational meeting, those people, they had no excuse anymore. And so now we actually have some wonderful notes saying, hey, 
I've never been to church while I've been in Mexico, and it's love to be lovely to be part of this experience. But I'm also going to this Monday night thing and this right relations thing, and, and they are still experiencing church within it all. And our music piece, piece is a part of that. And the last thing we did was uh, we've actually just developed a free music, music preschool program, and it's aimed at people not our congregation actually we uh we don't actually have a lot of two and three year olds but we have we live we are our church is in a neighborhood that's booming with two and three year olds and we said we'll come to the church have a music class come together and they play and they do music and the goal of that is just to inspire a lifelong of, of uh of music appreciation but also possibly you know spiritual expression later on so that's a little bit about it fantastic that's amazing um, so I'm going to jump into the first question, which is, what inspired these projects? How are these ideas conceptualized? And what really spurred the need to start something new and fresh? Gloria? Okay, well, this is part that I feel a little bit at a disadvantage about because I wasn't really there when that was when that inspiration was happening. This, uh, the eco commenting work really grows out of uh, work that uh, Reverend Dr. Ted Reeve, who is the minister at my church here in St. Paul's Aurelia, and uh, Right Reverend Bill Phipps. So they had been working together for many, many years. Uh, they worked together on um, something called Faith in the Common Good, a project uh, in Toronto. And uh, they also come out of a strong understanding of the United Church social gospel. So I think I've heard Ted talk about this a number of times, so I feel quite confident in sharing that with you, that that's, that, that was part of it. And, and they were just really aware of all the things that are happening within our communities, within Canada and globally, all the huge shifts and changes and upheavals that are happening with, you know, political changes that are happening. And of course, the climate changes on everybody's mind. Uh, the concerns around the economic imbalances with the 1%, those kinds of ideas. And they just really thought that with the church having such a strong background um, in the social justice area, that, that this is an opportunity to build on that, to take a look, treat it as what Ted calls a liminal time. So a time where there's you know, because there is so much change and upheaval, it's also an opportunity to input into those times and, and make, make some uh, suggestions of how uh, we can live in a positive way in, in these times. So it's kind of scary time for a lot of people, um, but it's also an opportunity. Um, and, you know, at the same time, we know that the attendance at church is dropping. And so it's also a piece around how do we get even like language around that appeals to what's called the postmodern uh, culture that we're living in right now? How, how do we get people to hear our message um, in these times and, and therefore allow the, the church to be a part of that? And uh, so they, they had came across with this eco commenting. And I thought I should just take... A little bit of time now to talk about what is this term eco commoning because we get a lot of questions and in fact we've spent a lot of time uh, with the uh, the two groups just examining that question so so if eco commons then a commons is a thing a noun and commoning is the verb or the process, and it's based in a really old, old concept. You probably have heard of the commons in Scotland, for example, um, and that was where people were gathered around a shared need, a common need, and they worked together to find solutions that were mutually beneficial. So um, when you think about the commons in Scotland, and I we reuse that because we um, used a book called Reclaiming the Commons for the Common Good by Heather Menzies quite a lot. And she talks about going to um, her historical backgrounds in Scotland. And there, there was uh, land that a small village would share for all of their grazing of their animals and 
farming their crops and so on. And they had a very organized way that uh, the land would be cared for and shared. And they had, everybody had roles within that. Um, and there were mutual decisions made around what the rules were going to be. Mm -hmm. They had, um, you know, if you didn't follow the rules, they had measures that could be taken about that. So, so it, it's a, uh, really a, a beneficial way to, to work together. It allows for internal governing, uh, that kind of thing. And so uh, the other, it's based on an understanding of people as being collaborative, collaborative, uh, whereas we're often being told in the worldview that we kind of live and move in every day, we're told, oh, people are naturally competitive. Well, actually, no, the archaeological evidence would show that the reason the human species survived uh, was because we work well together. Um, and uh, it's, we can work with mutual respect and concern. There's a, a common interest in care for the land and looking for the good for all. So that's what commons and commoning is all about. And the eco uh, Bill and Ted added that in there because we know that we need to kind of keep being reminded all the time that when we're thinking of um, life or thinking of all of life, all of creation, uh, kind of moving away from the sort of people-centered thinking that, that's been so characteristic of us in the past century or so. So it, it's really marking, uh, it's a worldview shift. Uh, that's what we're really working on and moving away from that market co economy approach of competition um, and the individualism and that kind of thing. So um, one of the things that we have developed that you'll be able to reference later is the eco commoning website. And in there, the, there's a quote taking from the quote at the front. It says it a way of life with people cooperating in their living and working and a respectful interconnection with their habitat. So that's some definition around that. Um, what an amazing quote. I think I'll stop there for now. <laughs> that's amazing, thank you. Um, Tina, do you want to talk about what inspired your projects? I'm, I'm muted. <laughs> Great. I, I'd like to say that I have the, the privilege of having been invited in the eco commoning group with, with Gloria. So that's that's great. Thank you, Gloria. Um, we reframed our, our way of, of telling stories uh, based on the fact that we wanted to see how COVID-19 had affected our community. Mm -hmm. So we had um, we had young people from the Canada Summer Jobs who came in and they were taking photographs. We, we actually, um, they actually came up with the, you know, those iPhones because they're, the, you know, the basic things to photograph people and called out and say, who would like to have their picture taken and, and tell their story. And we were amazed that um, we learned the three things. The first thing we learned is that um, everybody wants to be seen they want to be acknowledged. They want to be heard. And, and we heard so many stories uh, about how people were, were acting, acting to, through COVID. The second lesson we heard is that the hunger for human connection is more powerful than anything, even, even the hunger for permanent uh, housing. We had people who, um, who were given housing through from streets to home. But all they ever did was call back and just say, we want to go back. We want to see your community. We want to go back to our community and, and that kind of thing. And, and that was very powerful to us. The third thing that we learned is that everyone desires to reach out and help for the common good. So people, as an example, uh, started looking up ways on how can I be helpful for my neighbor? How can I... Um, how can I go and give food or how can I get medication for my neighbor who, who has a hard time getting down the, down the stairs to, to pick up the, the takeaway food? So there's all these kinds of things that we found um, from 
just retelling that story and then looking at the whole idea of community. And I think one of the, what this brought out for us is the stories that came out as well from other neighborhoods, like the Neighborhood Land Trust in Parkdale is something that got people really excited and interested. We've also been uh, conversing with the Black um, Food Sovereignty Movement and having those conversations and seeing how hunger um, has a common place with everyone. And, mm -hmm. and it's more than just looking for food security, it's looking at food sovereignty mm -hmm. and finding a place and having that trust that you will have a home and you will have a place. So it's, a, I mean, I can go on and on, but I'm gonna leave it there. Just say that those are the things that kind of inspired us to go into, into, into looking for, uh, into that direction of where we went with Seeds of Hope. Amazing, yeah, and I, I think it's something a positive that has come out of COVID is it's kind of forced us to reshape our perspective on things and highlighted certain aspects that we might've taken for granted a little bit before and kind of in, encouraged us to look at differently. Uh, Anne, do you want to talk about what inspired the expanding music beyond Sunday? Uh, sure, I think I expanded on that a little bit yep. too prematurely, but we'll just talk about it a little <laughs> bit. Uh, and uh, sorry about that. Uh, you know, I, I number one was obviously connectivity, um, and I'll, I'll go a little deeper with some of the other stuff I said. Is that um, we actually had a high level of musician fatigue in our in our um, in our building. Well, it wasn't in our building; it was it was online. But we had so many of our musicians that were had formerly, you know, played together, and we were finding even not enough space uh, on Sundays for that to happen. So it organically sort of went to beyond Sunday. Um, and one of the things that other inspired inspired us was, was our need for our ministries, our small ministries, to stop being siloed. So we had over here, you know, right relations. Here we have uh, affirming. Here we have contemplative. Here, you know, like everything siloed in their own world. And the world of the weave between these ministries was really just not a focus ever. <laughs> and um, we found that music could be possibly that roadmap between it and really took our, uh, our leaders aside and said and tried to inspire them to say, okay, where do you see music in your ministry? Like, where do you see it fitting in, in, in your world? Um, and really uh, allowed them to dream a little bit. Um, and that permission to dream uh, really inspires a lot of things. Um, and uh, then the other need is that, you know, uh, John Pentland and Andrea Irwin are quite creative people. And sometimes, you know, my role as a whole is to actually understand their vision enough in the church and kind of put legs on it administratively and and logistically is to to make their their world come alive, basically. And part of that was that they had ideas around what music could be beyond Sunday morning also. It's like they they needed to get it out a little bit. So, and they really enjoyed working with the musicians um, beyond Sunday morning also. So it, it just allowed them to have a little more expressiveness in what they were trying to teach. So rather than saying, this is the scripture on Sunday and this is what we're learning, we said, okay, and it goes along with the siloed ministries also, let's say, okay, spiritual nurture, we're gonna be working on this lesson for the week. So it's, it was more thematic throughout the week, but we also used uh, music to help with that. And actually music stepped into that also with the theming. And um, one of the things that also that we kept identifying when, when we, we were doing all the space of COVID specifically is that there were many unchurched people, basically. I don't know how to say it other the basically people who had not experienced uh, a Sunday morning with us probably will never experience a Sunday morning with us, don't know our order of a service and things like that, but we're interested in the music component of Hillhurst that mm -hmm. had been presented either in or out of, of Hillhurst. And it we we wanted to lean into who those people were and what their needs were also um, and sort of stop serving, you know, ourselves and serve out, you know, as far even with music, not just outreach, you know, traditional outreach we we wanted to let music be an outreach piece also um and you know music serves a lot of purposes it serves a mood elevation it serves a piece of connection with others it serves just a sense of community so we wanted to be able to say hey people that have never sat our pews um 
we're going to help you think about what this space is um, beyond what you have defined it in your head um, to allow you to, to be able to connect with us. Um, some of those people are still around, some are not. Um, and where I end up with all of that is I'm grateful for the experience of it all. Mm -hmm. So that's the piece that has um, now the neat part of that is that we uh, have seen quite a few people uh, stick with us um, uh, across the country. And now uh, we are trying to actively find ways to say, okay, now that you, we can do it all this back in the, in the, in the building, it's really critical to keep your eye out there also. So we actually have on our worship planning team, we actually have a person who lives uh, in BC, doesn't ever come here, but she's part of our actual planning every single week to remind us every single week that we are part of something bigger than our, than our sanctuary. So she tells us, gives us feedback about the shots, the sound, the this, the that, or if we're doing communion, okay, how are you celebrating communion online? And if it's part of music, if we're doing some sort of rounds in the sanctuary, we always forget, oh, well, what's happening online? How are we instructing them online to be a participant in this? So even music in that, in that part is really important. So uh, I guess we're inspired by the overall uh, need. It sounds a little selfish, but it, <laughs> we, we had needs. So. No, that's amazing. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, Gloria, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the impact that eco commenting had on your community and what you've seen and what response the community gave you. Okay, you jumped questions on me, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's just still, I've got something on my screen saying something funny. Okay. Uh, impact in the community, eh? So I think a tricky part about trying to talk about this particular project is that I'm not really talking about my local congregation. The community in this case is really the United Church community as a whole at one level, but recognizing that at another level, eventually it does, in fact, come into the community because in the end it's influencing what's happening and how things are happening at least that's what our dream is that it will be affecting all of that um so i do know it's interesting because of working here in saint paul's the resistance that we did find within the local congregation is just around that the terminology of eco commons what does that mean and it, feels like you can explain it and explain it in different directions and people still uh, kind of struggle or uh, with understanding what that means. And so I'm not really sure what's happening there, whether that's um, people truly not understanding if it's such a shift in world uh, outlook that people are struggling with that, or if it is another uh, form of resistance to change. Um, so don't really know the answer to that question at, at this particular point in time. I think within the, um, the two groups that we're working with, I think something there is that uh, people have often mentioned within our discussions at how much they value um, the sort of the safety and the feeling of that that they can share whatever they need to share or say whatever they need to share with within the group. Uh, it's become a really strong uh, support group for people as they're trying to work in change it at the local level. So I think that's been a, a real positive impact um, from it. And the other thing that is happening, um, sort of not come to fruition yet, but uh, several of the, the people within the groups are trying to develop small local projects that would sort of like feed off of the work that we've done so far. So that's happening. Um, people are talking about using that commoning language within their worship services. So that kind of change is happening. Uh, one of the Ontario um, members is Michael Schuberg, who's with the um, Five Oaks Retreat Center. And so he is looking for ways to bring eco commoning into both the way that they're doing their programming, but also 
uh, have specific programming that would relate to that as well. The BC group is planning a fall forum, so stay tuned for information on that. Um, we did have an opportunity to uh, meet with uh, the moderator, Carmen Lansdowne, and she's been very interested to hear uh, the work that we're doing and was talking about thinking of ways to bring it into her uh, moderator theme mm -hmm. uh, going forward during her time. So those are some impacts that we've seen from the project. Fantastic. And Tina, I was hoping you could expand a little bit on what stage your project is now and uh, how did the support from the Seeds of Hope grant uh, help you get to that point? Um, we're at the stage where, because of the different um, exchanges of stories that people are doing and they're finding out about things like the, the Black Food Sovereignty Movement or the Land Trust Movement, mm -hmm. they want to go further with that. They want to see how we can actually have real housing that's affordable for everyone. Um, one of the things also that's happening is that, like, uh, that, that's on my little antsy, is that we're actually doing a guaranteed livable income vigil tomorrow. And uh, people are, are having a planning meeting at one o'clock and they're kind of coming in and out anxious to get me out of here. But <laughs> I'm, <laughs> um, so it's that kind of, looking forward now you heard our story now we want to move forward um now you've seen some of us living rough um we had encampments we had people who live in encampments um we'd like to see how is it that we can actually say we are our neighbor to each other by allowing us to live in dignity um and so those are the kinds of things so so we are exploring now what does it mean to get into a land trust what does it mean to be equal commoning in some ways in that way? Or, or what are, and how do we actually build food sovereignty in a land of plenty um, when we are still dependent on food banks and charity? And we're still dependent on the big guys telling us what to eat, where to buy it, how to plant it. So we're looking at that and just saying, yeah, we can we listen to that. I also have to say that we're also working with Indigenous peoples um, who are working on, on, on their ideas of, of, of food sovereignty. So it's, it's, uh, it's very, very, um, what, what you call ambitious. And at the same time, I'm, I'm looking at the, the hope that is around where people are at. So, so we're trying to, to say, well, you know, we, we can only do bite-sized pieces. We'll see how we can go with this because there's so many changes that are happening in our community. And, and sometimes the politicians have different ways of addressing it, but we know where our community is and we know what they want. Uh, well, not I don't know, but they know what they want. <laughs> Thanks. Perfect, thank you, Tina. Um, and Anne, I was hoping that you could um, talk a little bit about the process that yourself and Hillhurst came to the decision that this is a project that is needed and we need to apply for some grant funding from Seeds of Hope and the foundation. And if there was a particular reason why you chose a foundation as a landing spot uh, for a grant application. Um, yeah, I, I uh, had called uh, for the very first step in, uh, I think of, of everything is to, to call, I called the foundation and had a really long co congregate uh, conversation with uh, someone there about this entire idea around, I think I want to do this. I'm not sure. What do you think of it? Is so just flushing out the idea was for us step one mm -hmm. around, um, you know, the people at the foundation had, you know, uh, exposure to all of it <laughs> and allowed us to say, well, if you applied for it this way, you're, you're probably not going to get it because of this reason, or just kind of like let us a little bit. Um, and also, um, what I came to learn along the way is that um, the foundation has like a reputation for, for kind of dreaming what could be rather than what has been. That's kind of my overall understanding of what this situation is. And where I'm in such a unique position at the church where I focus on like logistics and fulfilling the vision, 
many times we have to go and soar of strange places and I and I have to say well what else and I learned that the what else often is a safe space for me to talk to the foundation about <laughs> and um risk just the word risk is often aligned with the word new sadly and new always leads us to why and the why has to be answered to the congregation <laughs> as to why are you spending my money this way and when you apply for a grant it allows you to have a little more risk in your decision making um and with it's not reckless by any stretch of the imagination um but it allowed uh just us to have the freedom to dream and the leadership to have a little bit more um yeah i, th I think freedom i guess that's the freedom to dream and we were it was a it was a it felt nurtured there so that's that's why we went to the foundation. It felt like uh, the values of the foundation were really aligned with ours. Uh, and we, you know, we have four cores is for, uh, hospitality, spirituality, social justice. And our last one is risk. So we actually have risk in our values. And so that that was great that the foundation was willing to take a risk on us. And we were happy to do that. So okay. thank you. <laughs> thank you, Anne. Um, I think what we're going to do now is we're going to jump to the question and answer portion of the webinar. We do have a couple questions. Um, I'm going to start with one from Tom, uh, which is also echoed by Dave, but it's um, how do you get people to adapt to a more broad spread use of the church sanctuary? For example, music, films, plays, etc. Uh, Non-church service activities in the sanctuary as part of the redefinition of church. I think, Anne, this is probably directed to you. <laughs> I would say, uh, number one, it begins with your leadership. It begins with your leadership. It begins with your leadership. And it begins with your leadership. It, um, the understanding of what your church is um, has to be uh, defined as something other than fulfilling your own needs. Are you serving your needs? Are you serving your community's needs? Or what, like, what is your purpose? And it, it really begins with that vision of, of why are you in your community or are you in your community? Like, those are some big questions to ask. They're like, what is your, what's your end goal here? Mm -hmm. So if your end goal is to be able to be part of a community, well, your church services are not really attractive all the time to them. They need other things. You have a beautiful sanctuary, which is a holder of all things beautifully and art artistically beautiful, right? And so to to say, well, because you don't fit within our little our little siloed uh, content, uh, we're not going to let you in here. And that is really not what the United Church is about, in my opinion. You know, I, I always say, you know, let's do something crazy. Let's be a united United Church. Like, let, let's let's work together. And I think that finding community partners and finding people in your neighborhood, someone's trying to get in this building. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, being part of the neighborhood is a really big thing. So um, and it's not just about like traditional outreach. It's about um, having um, intentional, your, your leaders are intentionally saying, who else is there that's not here? So I think that answers the question of like, who's saying no? I guess that's who's saying no is, is you need to ask them, well, why do we exist? Great, thank you. Um, Olwyn put into chat, uh, and I think this is for you, Tina, and I know you uh, responded, um, but it is around, oh, I think Tina's in something. So I'm gonna go to another question that we have, um, and this is talking about, um, the person's asking about resistance and wanting to try new ideas. And was there any resistance trying something new and innovative uh, moving forward and how um, you handled that? Um, it's open to all three of you, but I don't know if Gloria, you wanted to get crack at it first. I think there always is some resistance to change. It seems to be human nature. Um, I think you just kind of, in some ways, you keep on going and find one of the things that we had to do uh, that was actually quite a challenge was finding the people who would be willing to spend time uh, just thinking through things. 
uh, we did find that we tried to kind of go through, you know, more of a um, organizational kind of way. Like we went to the regional office and we asked them to make suggestions of people. Um, and, you know, that type of, that didn't work at all. And so what we needed to do was actually networking so that when we got one or two people that, um, you know, I, I managed to meet Michael Schuberg over a, a, a conference that Edge had put together that was about other ministries that were people were doing. And we talked about equal commenting there and he showed a little bit of interest. So we got him involved and then he knew somebody else who who then, you know, because they're sort of like minded in the sense of being open to risk and innovation. Um, he was able to help us make that connection and so on. So it became kind of a more informal uh, networking process rather than uh, a straightforward way. And I'm not sure if I've got the really answered the question. Can you remind me the rest of the question, Eric, just about resistance? Yep, it was if, if you had resistance and how did you handle it? And I think you answered it perfectly. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> It's a start. It's a start. <laughs> there's so much. Uh, there's so much around this, and the the process. I think one of the things that I really learned is that the process is not straightforward. And if one thing doesn't work, figure out another one and keep on going. I think when you're doing something like this, um, it's just not always going to work, and yeah. not not get discouraged by that. Great. Thank you. I, I want to make sure we get to this question because I think it's important um, and something that a lot of people think of constantly, but it's from Dave and it's, um, I'll put to all three of you, uh, maybe Tina, you can start, but it's, how do you respond to congregants or leadership team members who main question is, how will this get us to financial sustainability? I think that is a question that is always asked whenever someone per, uh, prompts something innovative and new, how will this help us get to a financial sustainability? Tina? That's that's actually one of the most difficult and easiest questions as well. We've always kind of thought um, the question is always asked: Who's going to pay for this? How does this pay for? How does this actually um, pay for the sanctuary or pay for the pay for this or pay for that? And we just answer: <laughs> God is so abundant in in what He gives. So. Um, we just do what we can um, and, and work it from, from there. I guess I'm speaking from a community ministry perspective, which is different than from a congregational ministry perspective. And I do respect uh, my colleagues who are doing congregational, congregational ministry who have to um, justify every little expense or every little risk that you take. So in some ways, um, just to give you an example, um, these are people who are poor. They don't have any money. But when there was a, a disaster in in um, one of the places that they lived in, and they cried and and they and they worried about it, they got together we, for a vigil. They brought food that they gave up to sell. They brought paintings and art crafts that they made to sell. And they put all that money together and they said, here, give it to the United Church so that they will go to those places and help them. These are very poor people. These are people that that took out, looked out for their dimes and their, their little mite. So we're looking at this. So the question, whenever the question comes up about who's going to pay for it, for some reason, God will. Um, anyway. No, thank you. And and do you have anything maybe to add to that from the congregational ministry side? Um, I guess I'm in, I'm in, I'm in uh, favor of looking at the actual cost breakdown of it and assessing, you know, uh, is there a cost that needs to be passed on to the user? So basically we have had programming where, you know, we have someone who comes in with an, you know, an honorarium of $900 and we take that and we say, okay, there'd be 25 people in this and we're going to break it down in that. And that is, programming that's you know it's a complete offset right so I would say that I I I guess where I've found more financial stability 
is being more direct more often with the ask of the congregation and telling the story of what you're doing actually creates that excitement. So uh, when you're doing the offering, you think of what really happened around here that's inspirational. Let's tell that story. Because what's happened more times than not is that even people on par will actually put extra money here and there to say, oh, by the way, I heard that you guys opened the door and gave out this or that this week. Oh, I heard that you ran a program. My granddaughter is really involved in that where she is. Here's some extra money. Your stories inspire your congregation and your doing inspires your congregation. So I'd say like the financial stability goes back to risk also, but your willingness to step into it in a, in a navigated way, not reckless, navigated way, but you have to step into it to start. You have to start. And I think that part is like the, the direct no all the time is not where you start. You have to explore. Great, thank you. And um, the last question for today, sorry, we have so many questions, we won't be able to get through them all, but please feel free to email them to any foundation staff member. We're happy to pass them on or answer them ourselves. But the last question, and I'll open it up to the three of you is, um, what advice would you give to anybody that is wanting to initiate a similar project or just an innovative project on their own? Uh, is there any anything that you learned and what you did that you think could be applied to anything like that? And you're unmuted, so do you want to try going first? Sure, <laughs> sure. I feel like I'm talking too much. Uh, so I I think that you begin with the values of your church, and you go from there, and you ask yourself how are you fulfilling each of these, and um, really take the time to think. I guess I guess it's just thinking and actually really planning together. And then the thinking, and you have to say, what's our action coming from this? So there has to be an action item to go forward. If you always have meetings that nothing, there's no action items, you're not, you're not doing anything. So if your action item could be to invite, the next step is could be to invite, you know, one of the people from the foundation just to help you facilitate a conversation about what could be, you know, that I think there's a willingness to do that. Um, so I think that, that, does that answer the question enough or? Yeah. Okay, all right. Gloria, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I really feel like um, one thing, if, if I was doing this again, I would <laughs> a, lot, a lot more time, uh, a lot more time at the front to, um, if you're working with a group of people who don't know each other to begin with, uh, you need to build those relationships because, you know, we, we hear that all the time that everything depends on relationships, but it really does. Everything depends on relationships. <laughs> Um, and the other thing that I found fascinating uh, was uh, kind of trusting that if you give the group a little bit of guidance, that um, really I feel like it's spirit led, that we, we would have kind of an idea of sort of an agenda, but it wasn't linear. I think when you're trying to do something that's creative and new and different, it's not always a straightforward uh, way of thinking of things that can stifle creativity. Whereas if you have an ideas of things that you want to cover in the conversation and then let the conversation flow out, that lo and behold, by the end of your time together, you look back and, oh, we did cover all of these things, but it, it grew kind of naturally. Um, and that seems that builds the confidence of the group. It enhances the willingness to take risk. Um, and so there's just a lot that that I learned personally out of that, never having operated in that way before. I've always used strictly a, a straightforward agenda. And this other learner centered approach, as it's called, worked much better. Amazing. Thank you. Well, that concludes our time today. I want to thank Gloria, Tina, and so much for joining and sharing everything today. I, I learned a lot and I think everyone else did too. Uh, and I think it's your journeys are all inspiring to us as well. Uh, I just so want to say you. something, Eric, just a yeah, second. Go. So, yes, just, sorry. I just want to say that um, when we received this grant, um, I'm working mostly with people who are, you know, not always churched or de-churched or unchurched. And when they found out that this is where the grant came from, there was a sense of happiness and relief that they're part of something. 
and they're part of the United Church of Canada, and they're very proud of that. Thank you. No, thank you for interrupting me to share that. That's uh, that's fantastic. Um, so thank you again, the three of you. It's been great. Um, and I want to thank everyone that joined us today. And I also want to um, welcome everyone to join a webinar that we're hosting next week um, on Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern and 9 a.m. Pacific. And it's talking about applying for a Seeds of Hope grant. And we're going to be doing a step-by-step -step walkthrough of the application and helping uh, kind of dissolve any myths that are there and help as much as we, po as we possibly can. So I hope you can all make that as well. And again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.